Hello everyone, welcome to Imperial College Computing Student Workshop. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Philip Wadler. But first let me start explaining why I'm wearing this strange piece of jewelry. It's a piece of motherboard with lambda written on it. And the reason is that uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Wadler, is considered by many the father of the modern functional programming languages. <laughs> <laughs> He'll explain later. <laughs> professor Philip Wadler, Wadler is a professor of theoretical computer science from University of Edinburgh, but his research spans a wide range of topics, from theoretical to highly practical, with one influencing the other. Let me give you just a few examples. He is a principal designer of the programming language Haskell, but he was also involved in um, adding generics to Java, which became the basis for Sun's design. As an example of practice to theory is his work on Featherweight Java. He devised Featherweight Java, a formal model of Java. His contribution to XCurie, a standard for curing XML data, is one of the first uses of formal semantics in industrial settings. Professor Philip Wadler is also an ACM Fellow of L and Fellow of Royal Society of Edinburgh and a past chair of ACM SIGPLAN. He's also a past recipient of the... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Fellowship. Without further ado, please welcome me in, in please join me. <laughs> please join me in welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Philip Fodler. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I want to thank Rumi for that lovely introduction. Um, only one correction. I am not the principal designer of Haskell. I am a principal designer of Haskell. There are many. Um, I want to thank uh, all the organizers for inviting me here to speak to you. I want to uh, thank you for showing up so I can speak to you. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is how to do research and how to communicate your research. Now, this is not because I think I am the best possible role model for you to follow. Um, in fact, I'm going to be basing this on other people who you might consider better role models, people like um, Richard Hamming, Strunk and White, and Donald Knuth. Um, I'm an okayish role model. But my goal here is not to say, follow what I do. My goal is not to say, follow what they do. My goal is to get you to think about what you are doing. So if I can just convince you that communicating well is important, that there are things you can learn about it, and that as you're communicating, you can think about what the best way to do it is, then I will have succeeded. And I have a couple of reasons for doing this. One is I think it's a great privilege to be able to speak to young researchers at the beginning of their career. And in particular, some of what Hamming has to say is stuff that I wish somebody had said to me at the beginning of my career. So it's great to have an opportunity to speak to you about it. And the other reason is I expect that someday I might end up reading a paper written by one of you. <laughs> And when I do that, I would like it to be a pleasant experience. <laughs> so I'm also doing this for completely selfish reasons. Okay, are there any questions? Not yet, you're all being shy. I hope that you won't hesitate to ask questions during the talk. Everything I'm talking about is something that there is no one right way to do. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. And if you want to get into an argument with me or just raise a comment, during the talk, that would be great. So I'm hoping that this will be a conversation rather than just one way. Does this work? 
So the first part of this is called You and Your Research, and it's from a paper and a talk of that title, written by Richard W. Hamming. How many people have heard of Hamming codes? Hamming distance? All oh, right, I'd never heard of Hamming distance before I started studying this guy. But um, he's worked at Los Alamos on the bomb. He worked at Bell Labs for many years, where I got to work later. So I recognize some of the places he's talking about. Uh, and then he worked at the Naval Postgraduate School until uh, he retired. He was the third winner of the Turing Award and the first winner of the IEEE Hamming Medal. <laughs> <laughs> he was also very good at getting people to name things after him. So, this is from the beginning of his talk. Uh, and I, I, will, uh, I will try to channel Hamming here. Say to yourself, yes, I would like to do first-class work. Our society frowns on people who set out to do really good work. You're not supposed to. Luck is supposed to descend on you, and you do great things by chance. Well, that's kind of a dumb thing to say. How about having lots of brains? It sounds good. Most of you in this room probably have enough brains to do first-class work. Now, he was giving this lecture at Bell Labs after he'd moved on um, to the Naval School. He'd come back to give this talk. This was a, a room full of people at Bell Labs. They're very bright, but you're very bright. So what he's saying there when he talks to the room and says, you all have enough brains to do first-class work, he means you. You do have it. Great work is something else than mere brains. One of the characteristics of successful scientists is having courage. Once you get your courage up and believe that you can do important problems, then you can. If you think you can't, almost surely you're not going to. So it's not luck. It's not brains. It's courage. Right? Now, you might not think of yourselves as being like the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz, uh, but that's the position that you're in. You need to get your courage up and think about what you could do that would change the world. If you look at something like SQL, say, right, which was invented, it was the first query language for a relational database. And the notion that, here, we can take all the data in the world and stick it into a relational table, and that will be adequate. Making that leap and saying, maybe not everything, okay, but enough to be of interest. Yes, we can put things in this format. That turned out to be a good guess. But making that guess requires huge courage. So courage is a lot of what's going on here. And I, I like illustrating talks with examples. That's another point we'll get to, is that's an important thing to do. So SQL occurred to me as a good example of courage. But does anybody else want to contribute their own example they can think of where courage was a key ingredient in making an important change or putting forth an important idea? You're scratching your head. Does that mean you've got an idea? No. OK, well, this will be a effect. Sorry? The photoelectric effect, right? Proposing quanta? Yes, that definitely required courage. Any ideas? Any examples from computing? Okay. Get your courage up so that you can contribute some good ideas. <laughs> what are the important problems? So, um, Hamming started to eat at the chemistry table in the refectory at Bell Labs, right? There's this huge refectory, and all the mathematicians sat at one end, and all the chemists at one end. There probably weren't any computer scientists back then. But people went by groups, and he said, no, I'm not going to sit with the mathematicians. I'll go sit with the chemists. Well, I started asking, what are the important problems of your field? And after a week or so, what important problems are you working on? And after some more time, I came in one day and said, well, if what you are doing is not important, why are you working on that? 
I wasn't welcomed after that. <laughs> right? So think about what the most important problems in your field are. And if that's not what you're doing, why not? Why shouldn't you be tackling the most important problems in your field? There's much more detail on this. I'm not going to go into the detail. I'm just going to do things over lightly. Um, I strongly encourage you to go off and read Hamming's original talk uh, if you want to get the detail. And even the video is online now. So you can see a video of him giving this talk. And if you go to my website, I'll give a link at the end, but you just use the right search terms. Um, and you can see all this. When you watch the video, you will discover that my Hamming voice is nothing like Hamming's Hamming voice. <laughs> but I invented it before I saw the video, so. <laughs> Develop reusable solutions. How do I obey Newton's rule? He said, if I have seen further than others, it is because I have stood on the shoulder of giants. These days, we stand on each other's feet. Right? What a brilliant image. Right? It's not clear if Newton actually said this quote. You can read a whole book about it. Um, but this quote of Hamming from this talk has become famous. Computer scientists don't stand on each other's shoulders. They stand on each other's feet. Of course, you can take that as an image of, well, you get a little bit of leeway standing on somebody's foot, right? Maybe half an inch. But of course, at the same time, you're kind of hurting the other person. And um, we do have ideas in computing that do let us stand on each other's shoulders, right? SQL is an example of that. It's a wonderful, reusable solution that other people can build on. But how often do we build tools that are really very painful for other people to use? And we really do end up standing on each other's feet. Now, if you're much of a mathematician, you know that the effort to generalize often means that the solution is simple. You all know that, right? right? If you're trying to prove something, the induction hypothesis is too weak, so you pick a more general theorem, and that becomes easier to prove. Same idea works in many things. I suggest that by altering the problem, by looking at the thing differently, you can make a great deal of difference in your product, final productivity. Because you can either do it in such a fashion that people can indeed build on what you've done, or you can do it in such a fashion that the next person has to essentially duplicate again what you've done. So let's just take a little survey. How many people have ever read a paper, and they read and they went, yes, I can see that they built a system that did such and so, but if I want to do it, I'd have to pretty much start again from scratch. The only thing I know is that they built a system that did such and so. How many people have read papers like that? Pretty much all of you. Can you name one? Uh, a paper on latent topic uh, analysis. A paper on latent topic analysis, OK. Um, and how many people have read papers where it just laid it out as a bunch of formulas and then you could sit down and re-implement it again later pretty quickly? Oh, many fewer. Damn, has nobody read any of my papers? <laughs> right. So I've got a few papers that just lay things out in equations. People say, oh, that was really nice. Well, yeah, because then you can go through and do it. So it's not just me. Of course, many people do this sort of thing. Right, but it's, um, and again, right, SQL, there are now lots of papers that you could look at that would tell you exactly how to take relational algebra and turn it into something you can implement. So there is lots of work out there on how to implement different things. Um, but when you're sitting down and writing something yourself, think about how do I make this so clear that I'm really conveying the essence of it and somebody can go down and do the same thing themselves. Or even better yet, how do I turn what I'm doing into a tool that I can publish the software of where other people can use my tool rather than re-implementing what I've done? So it's really important to take whatever you're doing and make it reusable. Okay? How do you judge that something is 
How do you judge that something is reusable? Think to yourself, well, could I pick this up and use it? And then think, if I didn't know what I know, if I only knew what somebody else knew, could I pick this up and reuse it? Right? So again, all of these are things that require judgment, and you just have to develop that judgment for yourself. And the first step in that is to think, hmm, I need to have judgment. Right? Go through some papers that you like and think which of these are reusable and which are not, and why. And by the way, I'm, I'm realizing now I'm kind of lacking in examples for this bit. I'm realizing I should do that exercise myself. So may maybe some of us will do that over dinner tonight. Um, or over beer. That's a much better way to come up with examples. <laughs> Sell your work. I've now come down to a topic which is very distasteful. It's not sufficient to do a job. You have to sell it. Selling to a scientist is an awkward thing to do. It's very ugly. You shouldn't have to do it. The world is supposed to be waiting, and when you do something great, they should rush out and welcome it. But the fact is that everyone is busy with their own work. You must present it so well that they will set aside what they are doing, look at what you've done, read it, and come back and say, yes, that was good. If they don't stop and read it, you won't get credit. So I feel about this point very strongly. And many people, I think, feel a force in the opposite direction. If you make what you're saying too clear, it will look easy. And people think, oh, that's just trivial, and your paper won't get into the prestigious conference. But I can pretty much guarantee you that that is not the case. If you make it look really difficult, sometimes it will get in despite making it look really difficult, but not if I'm on the PC. If I'm on the PC, I will be sitting there arguing, nope, 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 tell them to go back and make it clearer. On the other hand, I've just been sitting on the ERC for Popple, and we saw one paper come by. It was a very simple idea, very neatly explained, and something happened that I've only seen happen once or twice before. Right? Each paper gets rated A, B, C, or D. A means, I think you should accept this. B means, well, you could accept it, but I'm not going to argue in favor of acceptance. C means, well, you could accept it, but I really think you shouldn't. And D means, don't accept this. So A for accept, D for don't. Um, and this paper got four A's. This never, it had four reviews and four A's. This never happens. Right? And it was because it was a simple idea, very well explained. The fact that it was a simple idea counted for it, not against it. Yes? I want to contradict you a bit, Phil. Okay. <laughs> we have been on the same PC several years ago. Yes. And there was a paper that presented the solution to... I thought of exactly this when I was saying this. I forgot that you were on the PC and could point out my lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, Sophia's about to mention that there was one paper that I was saying, no, I don't think we should accept this. And everybody's also saying, but this is a really good idea. If we don't accept it, it won't get published. I'm going, but I'm really having trouble following it. Somebody else on the PC said, yeah, but I could follow it, and I think it's a really good idea. And I said, oh, well, OK. I regretted it ever since. <laughs> I don't know which paper you are talking about. It's a, it's a different story. Oh! <laughs> the story is that the solution was very complex. Nobody could quite understand. But nobody could come up with a better solution. And what you argued, Phil, was it's a very important problem. They should come and try and explain it to us. And you did very well because there's a lot of research that has followed and the uh, solutions have been improved. Ah, so I argued in favor of, of publishing at that time. It must have been a really important problem. A very important problem. Yeah. OK, so if it's a really, really important. Right, so, so these authors had their courage up and they tackled a really important problem. 
and they got away with not having perfect methods of expression. Okay. But best, of course, is if you have both. Um, and I do want to encourage you to go look at some of the papers that you really like and look at them and judge, okay, which of these are well written and which are not well written. I remember when I was a doctoral student, my supervisor, Bill Sherless, um, handed me papers by Dana Scott and said, read these, they are really well written, understand why they are so well written and try to emulate that. Right? And that was very good advice. Um, the other thing you can do right, to try selling your work is to try making it entertaining. Right? So we're supposed to be scientists, we're supposed to be very serious. But in fact, right, you all know that if you go to a talk and somebody begins with a joke, you enjoy it much more. And the reason for that is not necessarily because it's a really funny joke. It's just because if the speaker begins by trying to say something humorous, you understand that the speaker is interested in making it a pleasant experience. So it really conveys something to try to use humor. Okay? If you really have your courage up, you could try to do something like this. You could try to say, well, you, know, you could witter on for a bit about lambda calculus, say. Right? You were talking about having a lambda on your um, pendant. Uh, how many people here are familiar with lambda calculus? Paul's not raising his hand. He is a liar. <laughs> right? So lambda calculus is a perfect idea of a wonderfully simple idea that has huge impact um, because people can reuse it. Right? So lambda calculus is a model of computation invented by Alonzo Church in the 1930s just before computers were invented. In fact, just before Turing came up with his own model of computation, and Turing then went and studied as a student with Church. And you can find a paper by Turing talking about Turing machines and talking about the equivalence between Turing machines and lambda calculus and pointing out that this equivalence is important because it then means that you can write down your programs in the, quote, more elegant unquote, lambda calculus. Turing was very bright. Turing had good taste. So lambda calculus is really very important as a fundamental idea. It's even more important because at the same time that Church was inventing lambda calculus, Genson was inventing the two methods of logic that we use today, natural deduction and sequent calculus. And all you need to do is wait 50 years, and you discover that Church's simply typed lambda calculus and Genson's natural deduction are an exact one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is something called propositions as types, or the Curry-Howard correspondence. And it means that lambda calculus is not just um, a random idea, right? The fact that the same thing crops up in a completely different context means that it's something really quite fundamental. So it's very easy to use as a model of a programming language. It only has three constructs, right? Compare the three constructs you get there to what you, you know, the Java book is yay thick, right? And the grammar of it is, is about 20 pages. So think of, th you know, three simple constructs versus 20 pages. So it's a very nice, simple model. Rumi mentioned um, featherweight Java, which was an attempt to capture an essence of a tiny bit of Java almost as simply, but not quite as simply, as lambda calculus. So it's really nice to have simple models that you can build things on. You can go much further if you start from a simple model that's easy for your audience to understand and build on. It's a matter of having the courage to pick out a particular abstraction and claim that it was right. And it really did take a lot of courage for Church to do this. And indeed, he didn't write the explanations very well. And nobody believed it was a universal model of computation until Turing came along, explained why his machine was a universal model. And then people were happy also that lambda calculus was a universal model. But now we understand it very well, and it's really a fundamental idea. So the reason I waited on for all like that for a moment is that you can all understand that some of us feel very strongly that lambda calculus is a good idea. And the way you could convey that is they get to the end of your talk and they go, so you understand that when you face a tough problem, that that is a job for lambda calculus. <laughs> Thank you.
And if you do it right, your audience will applaud. And they will remember that at the end of the talk. And so the talk will stick with them a bit. Okay, so that's um, one technique that you could use for um, making your talks memorable. Of course, if everybody does it, then I'm out of a job because it won't be unique anymore. But we'll all have fun. Right, so somebody once described this as um, computing science as cosplay. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say from um, summarizing a little bit of what Hamming had to say. And uh, I encourage you all to go off and read more about that. And um, does anybody have any favorite books or articles by other scientists talking about the best way to do scientific research? There's The Mathematician's Apology by Harding. That's a good thing to read. Uh, there's Metaware's book whose name I can't recall. Does anybody have a favorite book? No, okay. You should. Go off and find a favorite book about how to do science. Now the other thing you should have is a favorite book about how to communicate well. And I have one. It's right here. I forgot to take it out in advance of the talk. If you have props for your talk, get them ready in advance. Don't be pulling them out in the middle of the talk. There's my favorite book. And there's my favorite book. So this is The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. And I have three copies of it. Right, it really is my favorite book. Um, this is the first copy that I bought as a graduate student. This is the more up-to-date fourth edition that I bought when it came out. And this is the deluxe hardback illustrated edition <laughs> that my wife bought me for my birthday a couple of years ago, uh, which shows that I'm not the only person who loves this book, right? People love it enough to do a hard copy illustrated edition. How many of you own The Elements of Style? Tiny fraction. How many of you have read it? Slightly larger fraction, good. I'm glad it's a larger fraction rather than a tinier fraction. Um, so what you can see about this book right, is it's thin. Okay? It's inexpensive. It's less than six pounds from Amazon. I, I shouldn't mention Amazon specifically because they're um, horrible corporate people that don't... Yeah, corporations are people now, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. They're horrible corporate people that don't pay their taxes. Um, but they're from any bookseller. You can get this inexpensively. So it really doesn't cost you very much money, right? Six pounds is nothing compared to the tuition for university or even compared to most of the textbooks that you would get. And it doesn't take that long to read. Right? So not much cost in money, not much cost in time. This is probably the single best investment that you can make in your career. I'm serious about that. Right? Communicating well, you will know, is very important. And this will give you some great ideas about how to communicate well. So I urge it on you much, much, most strongly. Let's see. Right, but I'm not going to start with a quote from Strunk and White. I'm going to quote, start with a quote from George Orwell from a short essay of his, again, on how to write well, called Politics and the English Language. A man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure, and then fail all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language. Huh. So here's an example from Strunk and White, and it is an example so Strunk and White is written with examples, and many of them are of this form. You have a left column of poor writing and a right column of better writing. And just, if you look at any one page of the book, you'll see that there are lots of these double columns. So just on two pages, there are one, two, three, four, five different displayed examples, four of them as double columns. And each of the displayed ones often has many parts to it. So it's just chock-a-block with examples. 
Um, and what they would do is they'd have a, a poor example on the left and a better example on the right. And they had good examples in the sense that they didn't make them up. They went out and found examples of poor writing. They did not actually cite their sources, so it's not to embarrass the sources too much, um, but all their examples of poor writing are something that they really found. So here they're trying to explain that you should express related ideas in related ways. You'll notice that I'm all over the map here. Right? I was just talking about very high level things. Writing clearly is important because it lets you express your ideas. Um, use lots of examples. Those are very high level ideas. Now I'm going to talk about something very low level. Express related ideas in related ways. This is about sentence structure. So all of these things are important. Clearly in half of a one hour lecture, I'm not going to convey every important idea to you. And again, my goal is just to get you thinking about these, to get you going off to original sources like Hamming's lecture, like Strunk and White's book, and for you to move on from there. So here's, what, here's a, a poor example. The French, the Span... The, blah, 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 blah. Let me try that again. The French, the Italians, Spanish, and Portuguese. Right? So this person started to stick this the in there and then sort of gave up halfway through. That doesn't really work very well. Right? So what works well is if you say the French, the Italians, the Spanish, and the Portuguese. That works. Right? Of course, you could also do, go the other way and say the French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. But pick a design and stick to it. My objections are, first, the injustice of the measure. Second, that it is inconstitutional. Second, that it is unconstitutional. So that's fine. But look at how by expressing parallel ideas in parallel ways, you can make it stronger. My objections are, first, that the measure is unjust. Second, that it is unconstitutional. So this simple dull phrase, that it is, works very well. Notice that they could have even made it stronger, right? My objections are, first, that the measure is unjust. Second, that the measure is unconstitutional. Right? You need to weigh what works best. And this one has stuck with me my whole life for some reason. Formerly, science was taught by the textbook method, while now the laboratory method is employed. Right? Lots of you would probably have been taught, don't write in a repetitious style. It's dull. And so you should think up different phrases so that um, your writing is more lively. And often that's true. But it's not true when the best thing to do is express a parallel idea in a parallel way. So that's perfectly good fine writing, but here's better writing. Formerly, science was taught by the textbook method. Now it is taught by the laboratory method. Okay? So express parallel ideas in parallel ways. Any questions about that? Okay. Going back up to a high level, this is advice from Sir Tony Hoare. Um, criticize yourself and not others. Uh, and well, I'll get my own gloss on this in a minute. When you describe your own work, I've met Tony, but I can't do his voice, I'm afraid. So, so you're losing out here because his voice is wonderful. Um, when you describe your own work, you should always emphasize its limitations. Always emphasize the merits of the work of your predecessors and rivals. Never claim to have remedied some defect or limitation in somebody's work. Point out how good somebody's work is and say, I have just made a small improvement in this particular aspect of it, then people will be on your side. But you'll never get published. <laughs> but you'll never get published. Right, so many people think that if they're writing a paper, what they must do is have a related work section, and what the related work section must do is say, everything that came before me is, please forgive my use of the technical term, crap. <laughs> you do not need to do that. You can begin by saying, um, here is the work of um, X. 
Again, I should be able to think of a good example off the top of my head, but I'm not going to do that. But here's the work of X. X's work is absolutely marvelous, except X neglected to do, except we can now do this one other thing that X hadn't thought to do. Right. And it's far better if you express it that way. So don't pull your punches, right? If there are defects in the work of X of course, that you improve on, of course you want to talk about that. But you don't need to call it a defect. You don't need to find every single thing that has gone before and find something that they did wrong and you did right. That's not necessary. All you need to do is establish that your stuff is also worth looking at, that it has complementary advantages to what's out there. Example, Church and Turing. Right? Um, Turing, right, there's this rush to find, uh, and, uh, to define what effective computability was, to define the notion of a computer program. But the people didn't realize that's what they were doing because computers wouldn't be invented for another decade. In fact, many of them by the people that understood this work where they were trying to define algorithm. Um, Church got there first. Um, Turing's advice, so Turing was an undergraduate when he did this work, you understand. Right? This, I, I, I find this really scary. Right? When he was an undergraduate, he did this incredibly important thing. He must have had his courage up. Um, and uh, Max Newman was Turing's advisor, and he found Church's work. He went, oh, shit, we've been scooped. I'm not sure if he used the word, oh, shit, but uh, I think he did use the word scooped. Um, but they decided, well, Turing's approach is a bit different, so it has complementary advantages. And they did not publish saying, nobody can understand what Church has done, although that was actually true. Right? They just said, here's another way of doing it. And the work was very influential. Right? Gödel was very interested in this problem. Um, uh, Church went to Gödel and said, here, I think this is a universal model of, comp of um, effective computability. And Gödel said, no, I don't think that's right. And Church said, okay, you come up with one, and I'll prove mine is equivalent. And Gödel did. And Church proved his equivalent. And went back to Gödel and said, see, your model and mine are the same. And Gödel said, oh, really? Ah, mine must be wrong then. Only when Gödel read Turing's work and found that Turing was also equivalent to the two models, then Gödel believed that they had found um, a model of effective computability, and he then accepted what we now call Church's thesis. So um, you don't need to say that what your predecessors did was awful. You only need to point out a way in which what you're doing is complementary to this other work. It is very important to explain how what you're doing is complementary to the other work. You must do that. Okay. But it's not necessary to say that the other work is bad. Um, and in fact, right, there's a good reason to say it's good, right? Because who's going to be the reviewer on your paper? <laughs> right, so there's a, there's a lot of good reason to do that. There's another reason to say that your predecessor's work is good work. Uh, at some point, I became secure enough in my career that I could begin doing this. Because right? nobody had given me this advice about, um, no, never slag off your rivals and predecessors, which is great advice, but I didn't have that. So, of course, I did, um, just like you guys do sometimes. And, um, but you won't anymore, right? Um, and when I got to the point in my career where I felt a bit confident, I said, you know, I think I'll just say nice things about this other piece of work. I gave a talk saying how wonderful this other work was. I came away from the talk and I thought, wow, I really felt good giving that talk. I felt statesmanlike. <laughs> um, so do it because it's a good thing to do. Because you know, you wouldn't be in this area if you didn't have wonderful predecessors that had done wonderful work that you are building upon. So just say how wonderful it is. That's fine. And then point out where your work is complementary or an improvement on what has come before. 
And among other things, I think you'll actually find you feel better doing it that way. More advice from Ullman? Avoid. Yes, question. I had a point about your previous slide. Uh, doesn't the first sentence contradict a little bit your earlier point about selling your own work? Oh, very interesting point. Okay. When you describe your own work, you should always emphasize its limitations. Is that a contrast to selling your own work? Uh, no. I would say part of selling your work is that people, you want people to believe they can trust you. They will only believe they can trust you if they know you are telling the truth. As a scientist, it is your moral duty to be aware of the limitations of your own work and point them out. And you will find that if you write a paper that doesn't talk about your, the limitations of your work, the um, referees will. So you should do both. You should sell your work and you should describe its limitations. Yes. Say what's good about your work and express what its limitations are. Excellent question. Thank you. Down to the low level again. Avoid non-referential lists. While it sounds pedantic at first, you get, so this is, um, oh no, sorry, this is not from that uh, same technical writing course. This is from uh, a note that Jeff Ullman wrote in Communications to the ACM. While it sounds pedantic at first, this is advice to advisors, but you as a student can benefit from it as well. You get a huge increase in clarity by chasing the non-referential this from students' writing. Many students and others use this to refer to a whole concept rather than a noun. For example, if you turn the sproggle, for example, right, Alman following his own advice, if you turn the sproggle left, it will jam and the glorp will not be able to move. This is why we threw the bar. Now, the writer of this prose fully understands about sproggles and glorps, so they know whether we threw the bar because glorps do not move or because the sproggle is jammed. It is important for students to put themselves in the place of their readers, who may be a little shaky on how sproggles and glorps work and need a more carefully written paragraph. So this turns out to be advice that's really easy to apply. Whenever you've written a sentence, go back to the sentence. If the word this appears in it, check. By th this, do you mean the most recently preceding noun phrase. If you do, fine. If you don't, rewrite the sentence. Notice that the word this does appear in the text once. Um, right, whether, does this have a point on it? No. Does this work? Yes. Uh, this prose. Right, so this refers to that particular thing treated as if it were a single object. And he says this prose to make it completely clear. Very often when I use the word this, I refuse to use it unless it's immediately followed by a noun that makes it clear exactly what object I'm referring to. Okay, so very simple thing to do, but makes your writing a lot clearer. I mentioned these notes by Knuth. Um, the beginning part of them is about two or three pages. It's notes on technical writing. It says things like symbols in different formulas must be separated by words. So bad, examples again, bad. Consider SQ comma Q less than P. Good, consider SQ comma where Q is less than P. Just having a word between makes it easy to, easier to read the sentence it flows better um, and easier to see where the formula, different formulas are. Don't start a sentence with a symbol. Bad. X to the n minus a has n distinct zeros. Good. The polynomial. X to the n minus a has n distinct zeros. The reason for doing this is people have built into their heads that sentences begin with a capital letter. 
So if you can begin with a phrase that you are permitted to capitalize, that makes it easier to read. There's a dispute about symbols, right? Usually case counts in symbols. So what do you do if you want to begin with a symbol? Some people say begin with the symbol in lower case. Some people say, nope, it's okay to capitalize it if it's at the beginning of the sentence, because people want capitals at the beginning of the sentence. Um, that's what um, Brian Kernighan does, in fact. Um, but my own advice is, don't do either. Stick a word in front of it. Be instead of saying, foobar, capitalized or uncapitalized, say, the function foobar, and off you go. Um, don't use symbols like upside down A, backward Z, and so on. Replace them by the corresponding words, except in works on formal logic, of course, where they're actually what you are treating. So that's some examples of Canute's advice. There's lots more. I'm not going to go through it now. Again, I'm going to urge you, go look it up. There's some great, simple, easy-to-follow advice on technical writing there. Um, again, in these course notes for Knuth, you can find a long passage, quite well written, um, written by one of Leslie Lamport's collaborators, and then how he edited it down. And I'm not going to go through in detail, because I want to finish on time. That's other good advice. Finish on time if you can. Um, but you can see he made it about half as long. And very often you will find, if you just go through what you've written and think, how can I compress this down? you will often find that there are lots of needless words that you can get rid of and that you can compress it down to be much shorter. Study the masters. Here's a passage from Strunk and White. Vigorous writing is concise. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words, a paragraph no unnecessary sentences, for the same reason that a drawing should contain no unnecessary lines, and a machine no unnecessary parts. Concrete examples, vivid images, the phrase no unnecessary repeated four times in a row, perfect parallel structure. This require not that the writer make all his sentences short or that he avoid all detail and treat his subjects in outline, written a long time ago, so it's sexist, but that every word tell. And notice the wonderful word tell itself, which tells so appropriately. So, as I mentioned, find somebody who's writing you like, Knuth, Dana Scott, what have you, pick it apart, see what makes it work so well. So, here are some of the few further references that you can have a look at. Um, it turns out that um, Steven Pinker has just written a style manual. He's a cognitive psychologist, so he's written a style manual that actually draws on research about how people think, in part, in helping you to write clearly. Um, so I've not had a chance to read it yet. If one of you reads it and it's good, please tell me. Uh, but I had a look at it. It looks pretty decent. Uh, but there are lots of things you can do. And if you go to my web page, and you can just put in my last name, and elements of style, and this should pop up. And it's got lots of links to the things I've been talking about, um, including a link to a video of Hamming giving um, his talk. And one other thing that I urge you to do, you need to develop a good voice. And the best way to develop a good voice is to read good writing by others. So I mentioned that you should read good technical writing and take it apart, but just read any well-written fiction or nonfiction and take it apart and see what makes it tick. Or even just read it and enjoy it. And let's seep into your brain what wonderful words look and sound like. And that will help you to do a little bit of the same yourself. So to conclude, I began by saying you don't need luck. But you actually are extremely lucky. Right? If you're doing physics, they've had hundreds of years to go at it. Chemistry, a couple of hundred years. Biology, a few hundred years. Computing has only been around for 50 years. 
I think all the best ideas in computing are still out there to be discovered. Right? Well, we know one best idea has been discovered, right? The Turing machine, the model of effective computation that I was talking about, and the Lambda calculus, which is an equivalent model. So there's one good idea that we've got. You could have the next one like that. All you need to do is get your courage up. And unlike me, you're at the right age to do that. That's why I consider giving a talk like this the greatest privilege, because just possibly, I've just spoken the most important words in my life. And when I read that paper that one of you have written, I really will enjoy it. Thank you very much.